Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. And this is the Mystical Trinity by the Imperator of AMORC. An article taken from Rosicrucian Digest, Volume 23, Number 2, March 1945. The Thought of the Moth, The Mystical Trinity by the Imperator of AMORC. A mystic of old asked the question, what are the three most desirable things beneath the sun, not in the sun, but within it? Then he pronounced to answer his own question. He replied that the three most desirable things are life, light, and love. By the paradoxical statement that they are not in the sun, but within it, he meant that these are not properties or elements to be actually found in the sun, but nevertheless, they are dependent upon the sun and manifest within its sphere and influence. Life, light, and love are the most desirable things for man because without them, his existence is very definitely incomplete. Existence, so far as we are concerned as humans, consists of the state of consciousness. It is our awareness of internal and external impressions and all these realities of which we are conscious, life, light, and love, confer upon our consciousness or existence three dimensions, just as matter has its dimensions of length, height, and breadth. If a visible object, for example, appears to have only two dimensions, namely length and breadth, it is incomplete. We find it difficult to relate it to other things, to determine where it ceases to be and where other things come into existence. Also an over or under emphasis of life, light, or love causes a distortion of the human consciousness and makes our existence seem incomplete and unsatisfactory. It produces, shall we say, an unbalanced existence. Life, light, and love must not be thought of as mere esoteric terms or an aphorism. They are really states of existence. The different aspects of each constitutes a lifetime of study. However, it is advisable to analyze each of them briefly to determine whether we have neglected any one of them and consequently distorted and limited our existence. Life is indifferent. We are told by Epictetus in his meditations, but he also says the use of life is not an indifference. Now, this may be interpreted to mean that life fulfills its function of generation and of development of living things indifferently. Insofar as the individual is concerned, life follows a law of order and necessity in its creating. That is all one may expect from the physical aspects of life. When you reach maturity or when you have procreated or are able to procreate, the physical life cycle is completed as far as you are concerned. Life has no further interest in you. Life is entirely indifferent to whether you succeed in your ambitions or whether you fail. It is indifferent as to whether you experience suffering or happiness in the nature of life. These factors do not exist. Such values depend on the manner in which you use your life. Biological excellence exists only in that you are. The excellence of life is in the creation of you or the creation of any living thing. All other values which may be attributed to life come from application of it. We may liken physical existence to a shovel. The end of a shovel consists in its conforming to its design. A shovel was always nothing more. Any glory which can be attributed to it must come from its use in the hands of the user. And so, as Epictetus says, life is indifferent, but the use of life is not. It is also a law of life, we are told in philosophical literature, to do what follows from nature, namely, to pattern ourselves after it. If we desire every act and every circumstance of our living to keep up with nature, it is incumbent upon us to observe nature in her many moods and aspects. We may interpret this to mean that nothing exists outside of the pale of nature. As we have been often told, there is nothing new under the sun. 
Everything has its form or its cause rooted deeply in the laws of nature. Consequently, it behooves us, if we are to follow the laws of life, to tie fast to nature the elements of our imagination and our plans. The more, in fact, we inquire into the phenomena of nature about and in us, the more doors leading to the fullness of life will be unlocked for us. We can see this demonstrated about us. Every modern invention has its parallel in some existing phenomenon of nature. The camera, with its lens, iris, and even its film, corresponds to the human eye. The telephone receiver, with its oscillating diaphragm, may be likened into the human ear, which also has its diaphragm and impulses which are carried from it. The most delicate electrical system parallels the sympathetic and spinal nervous systems. So if we wish to expand our living, let us follow nature. Your life, your conscious existence can only grow as you absorb into yourself more of the cosmos in which you exist. The growth of the conscious life is a kind of accretion. It consists in adding to ourselves things and conditions around us. The conscious life may also be likened into a cell. We may assimilate into ourselves as the cell does, elements of the substance in which we exist, or our life will be exceedingly limited. The Game of Life Pythagoras compared life to the great games, such as the Olympic Games that were played in Athens. He said some went to the games to compete for prizes, others went there just to sell their wares as vendors, and, best of all, were those who became spectators of the games. The spectator of life is one who has a philosophical attitude. He does not presume that life has any single value to any man. He believes there are a variety of values and consequently he is always alert to many experiences, participates in as many as he possibly can, because in these varied experiences are varied gems. The gems which form the diadem of happiness, Pythagoras divided life into four quarters, each of twenty years. The first quarter is the boyhood period, the second quarter is youth. The third quarter is young manhood, and the fourth quarter, old manhood. These four quarters correspond to the four seasons of the year, namely, boyhood to spring, youth to summer, young manhood to autumn, and old manhood to the winter season. Henry Cornelius Agrippa, born in 1486, was a great occultist, mystic, and philosopher. In his renowned work, the magic mirror. He also divided life into four quarters. The first quarter, he relates, is from the first to the twenty-first year. It is the spring season of the life and represents youth, love, and growth. The second quarter is from twenty-two to forty-two. It is the summer period. It represents mind, intellect, maturity of thought, manhood, fruitage, or accomplishment. The third quarter, covering the years from 43 to 63, the fall season of life, he depicts as well physical and mental maturity and karma. The fourth and last, or winter season, includes the years from 64 to 84 and is the time of the Passover, or the preparation for transition. Each of these quarters of life, he stated, begins with the vernal equinox, the spring period, and each of the quarters of life ends at the winter solstice, about December 21st. Agrippa also related that man has three equal points in his life. In other words, there are three periods within life, and these three periods he referred to as being primal initiations, which we must pass through during our life period. The first begins after our physical birth, the first spring quarter of our life, from 1 to 21 years of age. The second period, or initiation, comes at 48 years of age, when we have crossed the meridian of life, or the zenith of our life's period. And the third period, or initiation, when we enter into the winter season of our life, the sunset, the closing quarter. He states that the upright body on the cross symbolizes 
these quarters of light. For example, the upper point of the cross symbolizes the spring season of life. The left arm of the cross represents the fall quarter. The right arm of the cross, the summer season. And the base of the cross, the winter season or the close of life. Agrippa analyzes most interestingly the value of these seasons or quarters of life and what man is expected to do to utilize them intelligently. By the time one has attained 21 years of age and has completed the spring season of life, he should then have received the tools for his future. These tools may be the trade or profession in which he should be traded or prepared for, or they may consist of the accumulated experiences of others, which were expounded to him by preceptors in schools or universities. The summer season of his life, the middle period, is the time for activity, mental and physical. It is time to produce, namely to create and manifest the ideals which should have been established during the spring season of life. If our products, our achievements during the summer season are not the best, it is probably due, says Agrippa, to our desultory living, to our neglect in preparing ourselves during the spring season of our life. Agrippa states that the winter season or the sunset years is the same time when man calls a halt to his labors. It is the time to reap the benefits, if any, from what he has procured, from what has proceeded. He states that this is the time when man strikes a karmic balance. He does not mean that. That is a time when we must compensate for what has occurred in previous incarnations. But rather that, that is the time we should begin to enjoy the results of thoughtful planning or living, or when we experience the result of careless living and wasted years. The Three Mystic Stages According to Islamic mysticism, or the mysticism of the Mohammedans, which, incidentally, is a highly organized and inspiring system of instruction, there are three stages of the mystic's life. These three stages also apply to those who are aspiring to the mystical life. Certain aspects are veiled in the beginning and in the middle of the mystic's life. In the beginning period, external things, the things of the world, temporal interest so occupy the consciousness, according to Islamic mysticism, that the inner sense, or God, is veiled from the consciousness. Man then gives little concern for the spiritual values of the divine impulses. Later, in the middle period of existence, a transition occurs. The world becomes veiled because man has a sudden awakening. He has realization of the spiritual nature, and he takes such a delight in it that he adjusts his whole thought and living in accordance with this newfound and newly realized experience. He is inclined to neglect practical living, the realities of his everyday world, and so the veil again comes before his consciousness. This middle period of the mystical life is called by the Islamic mystics the period of intoxication. It is a period of spiritual ecstasies, anaphletus, when the consciousness takes wings and transcends all worldly interest, sometimes to the detriment of its welfare. In the final stage of the mystical life, however, the created things, the things of the world no longer veil God from the consciousness of the mystic. He is quite aware of the nature of God, but also his realization of God no longer veils his consciousness of worldly things. God is seen as the creator and the universe as created things. In other words, in the final stage of the mystic's life, a balance is struck, and man has an equal appreciation of the law and the manifestation of the law. This final stage of the mystical life is appropriately called sobriety by Islamic mystics. It is the soberness of understanding, the temperance of understanding. It is neither the extreme of objective consciousness nor the extreme of divine consciousness. Rosicrucian View of Life what do the Rosicrucians say of life? We say that life, physical existence, so far as mankind is concerned, is for a 
very definite purpose. We are permitted to experience it so that we may learn the laws of existence, our own, and that of other things. This is accomplished through our combining the forces of nature, which are around us, only as we place ourselves where we are exposed fully to the laws and phenomenon of the universe are all our faculties, all of our powers drawn upon. One who excludes himself from the world, who becomes an anchorite or a hermit, fails to utilize all of that of which he is capable and consequently learns little of the laws of existence. For analogy, we are given eyes to perceive that substance and matter, visually, which might destroy us, crush us out of existence. If we could not perceive it, in fact, all of our objective senses, seeing, feeling, tasting, and so forth, are given us because our existence is in that dimension where we need these senses to cope with other substances, other masses such as ourselves. To live in accordance with those laws, those physical properties which have given us being, we must use these senses by which they can be discerned. However, we have also been given, besides our peripheral senses, and emotional nature. This has been conferred upon us for the purpose of evaluating the relationship of things to ourselves, so that we may establish such notions as good and evil, order and disorder, etc. Each thing lives fully, only to the extent that it expresses all of those functions of which it is capable. A deer which cannot run, or a rooster which cannot crow is not living fully according to those functions which it has. It is not true to the cause of its existence. Likewise, a man who does not exercise his reason, or a man who does not employ his emotional and physical faculties and powers is not living as a human. He is neglecting that of which he is capable. In other words, he is opposing the very order of his existence, and he can come to know only ennui by such living. The Rosicrucian concept of proper living is, first, to departmentalize your being. Determine what are the principal elements or factors of which you are composed. This is not difficult. You recognize your physical and material being. You know that if you neglect your body, the physical side of yourself, you are closing a door on part, an important part, of the complexity of your nature. Again, you recognize that you have an intellectual part to yourself, that if you have such faculties as reason, cogitation, and imagination, if you neglect them, then again another part of your being is deteriorating, atrophying from disuse. If you neglect any part of your being, it is like blindfolding one of your eyes. The range of your vision becomes limited. Therefore, your conscious existence may be distorted. And now for a consideration of the second dimension of our existence, light, of all the contraries in nature. The opposites, light and darkness, are the most obvious. To the primitive mind, both light and darkness have a positive quality. Darkness has as much an actuality to the primitive mind as does light. There are some myths of primitive peoples which have light being created out of the nature of darkness, but these are comparatively few. There are many experiences which are common to light and which we are accustomed to associate with the word light. By light, all of these things which constitute our visual world have existence to us. Even dangers are tangible, definite things in light, because they can be perceived. Their visual form depends upon light. When we open our eyes, light pours in and with it comes vision. And all of those scenes, events, and circumstances which we associate with light. Conversely, when we close our eyes, or when the sun is veiled by clouds, or by the curtain of night, darkness comes, and with darkness all of those things which we have known and which we have associated with light disappear. In darkness lurks the terror of the unbridled imagination. Things can be conceived but not perceived. In death, also, there is no objective vision but only darkness. Thus, darkness symbolizes death and oblivion. In Egypt, darkness and light were not conceived alone as two different qualities, but two different forces, like poles of a magnet. We know that the god, Ra, 
was symbolized by the sun and represented the positive creative force of the sun. And darkness was symbolized by the god Set. It represented inertia in contrast to the activity related to the power of the sun. Consequently, darkness was a negative state. In fact, the Egyptians referred in their psalms to the sun forcing its way through the billowing clouds of darkness of night to emerge in the dawn, indicating that darkness was considered an inert opposition to the active forces of light. Light as Illumination In the book of Genesis, in the Old Testament, it is said, Let there be light. Then we are told that God divided light from darkness. This very definitely indicates that darkness and light were considered by the ancient Hebrews as separate creations. It also indicates that the light of day was considered a physical condition and was referred to in that sense. The greater light had no mystical, no allegorical sense in this reference, because later we are told that God said, Let there be light in the firmaments of the heavens, and this referred to the stars and the moon, the lesser light. It concerned physical light, not a metaphor or an allegory. The symbolism of light and darkness does not definitely appear in the Bible until the New Testament. Several centuries after the books of the Old Testament, there darkness is made to represent concealment. Under cover of darkness, most sins are committed. Consequently, darkness takes on the moral value of evil. Conversely, light represents action in the open, things frankly and honestly done, and so light is symbolically associated with goodness and virtue. Then, we are told that our eyes may be opened, and our vision may be good, and yet we may not see. This implies that the mind is closed, that the mind is in darkness. Consequently, ignorance becomes associated with darkness. Wisdom is related to light and to the open and searching minds. It is often said that those who search for knowledge and for learning are dwellers in light. It naturally follows that light is commonly held to be synonymous with learning and knowledge. In fact, there are a number of fraternal organizations today who oblige the candidates or applicants for membership to state in their applications that they are searching for light before they can be admitted. It is meant that they are searching for knowledge and for further learning. However, the mystics had a far different conception of light. To them, it did not just mean knowledge and learning. And the mystics and the Rosicrucians of today distinguish between light and illumination. The distinction is a fine one, but worthy of our comprehension. Our eyes may be open, and our vision good, and we may see things which we have never seen before. Consequently, we have knowledge of their existence, and yet having seen them, and knowing that they are, they are without purpose to us. We are puzzled, still in doubt about them, and therefore our visual experience has little value to us. For example, we may be shown a large and complicated piece of machinery or laboratory apparatus. Our vision of it is quite clear. We can describe what we see, as well as the one who has pointed out the machinery to us. And yet, it is still puzzling and confusing. We may, therefore, have intellectual light and accumulation of facts, and yet remain very much mentally in the dark. Consequently, to the mystics, illumination means understanding. One may travel in light, thus one may be a searcher for knowledge, for new and strange facts, for unearthing information, probing into tombs, and yet that is not sufficient. He must with all of his light eventually attain illumination or comprehension. In the Confessio Fraternius, which was one of the earliest works issued by the Rosicrucian order in the 17th century, there was a statement to the effect that the world must awaken out of its stupor and go further to meet the sun of the morning. Now, during those days, there was an interest in knowledge and in learning. Men had vision, they could see, and many of them sought light, but the Confessio meant more than that. It meant that in going further to meet the sun and awakening out of its stupor, the world would sometimes have an understanding of itself and its purpose, Certainly today, humanity is still greatly in need of understanding, even with all of the light and knowledge which we have. 
in the Rosicrucian studies, it is said that illumination follows a period of meditation. This meditation is a deliberation upon the knowledge which the Rosicrucian student has acquired from the degrees of his study. Consequently, it proves that illumination is understanding, a something which must follow knowledge. One of the Rosicrucian degrees is known as the Illuminati. It means that at that time the student's consciousness, the various aspects of his consciousness, should be imbued with an understanding of that which he has studied. We therefore in life should make profound comprehension our goal, not just a greater fount of knowledge or a greater accumulation of external things and facts. Light must mean to us illumination. Kinds of Love Of the three dimensions of our existence, love is perhaps the most perplexing to mankind, and yet it is an experience had by almost every individual to some extent. Love is not a product of the mind. It is not an intellectual achievement, but an emotional, psychic one had by the self. And because it is such, it has been idealized by the poets and broads to such an extent that most persons believe that love is something to be left to a chance experience, or to be mysteriously obtained without formula or method. There are various kinds of love. In Sufism, Mohammedan mysticism, God's love is said to be expressed in man's love of the divine. For it was God, according to Sufism, who made it possible for man to love the divine. And so when man expresses divine love, a love of God, God is really loving himself. When man, therefore, denies himself divine love, he is restricting the nature of God, and Sufism, therefore, holds divine love to be the most exalted. Dudum, Mohammedan mystic, asks what is pure love, love free from depletion, then he replies to his own question. For the enlightenment of his disciples, he said that it is love of God, because the love of God is so absorbing that no other love can compete with it or detract from it. He further said that this love of God, pure love, is a disinterested one. By that, he meant that it is not affiliated by benefits which may occur from it. In other words, one who has this pure love will not love God anymore because of what may flow to him as a result of it, nor will he love God any less because it will require him to make sacrifices to love his God. Al-Ghazali, Mohammedan philosopher and mystic of the 10th century, taught the Islamic doctrines in Baghdad. He distinguished admirably between three kinds of love. The first is self-love and that is engendered by the instinct of self-preservation. Though many mystics and philosophers have execrated this self-love, he holds that it is very essential because at least we must love our existence sufficiently to want to be. For if we do not, we cannot experience any of the other loves. The second is a love of others. Because of the benefit which they bestow upon us, it is a natural love, and, in a sense, it is somewhat the same as the first or self-love, such as our love, for example, of the doctor because of his healing art, or our love of the teacher because of the instruction which he expounds. The third and highest love, according to Ghazali, is a love of a thing for its own sake and not for any benefits which may be derived from it. The thing itself is the essential of its enjoyment. It is liked for its own nature, just as the essence of beauty is the delight which we derive from it. He uses the analogy, the love of green things, the love of running water. These are not always loved because green things may be eaten or running water may provide drink, but they are also loved for the mere sight of them for their own essence, for the beauty which exists within them. Gonzale concludes with, Where beauty exists, it is natural to love. If God is beautiful, most certainly he will be loved by all of those to whom he reveals himself. And the more beautiful a thing, the more it is loved. Plotinus, father of Neoplatonism and who contributed much to the world's mystical doctrines, 
also declared that there are different loves. For example, the love of creation as a craftsman's love of his work, the love of a cabinet maker for his work, or a goldsmith for the fruits of his art, or a student for his studies. The highest love, says Plotinus, is the hierarchical love. It is the love of the universal soul within us for the absolute, for the oneness of which it is always a part. What do the Rosicrucians say of love? From a Rosicrucian viewpoint, a rational approach to love is necessary. We realize that love is not an intellectual experience, but, on the other hand, we also realize it is essential to understand the causes of love, so as to be able to produce the most lasting effect. First, we say that all love is desire. Basically, it is a yearning or an appetite, if you will for that which brings us pleasure. No one has ever loved that which brings pain, suffering, misfortune, or torment. This brings us to the point of considering just what is pleasure. It is a satisfaction which arises from experiencing the plenitude of our being, the fullness of ourselves. The harmony of our being consists in the complete functioning of all of its qualities or properties. All of these impressions which we receive and which when translated into sensations, complement and advance as well as integrate the qualities of our whole being are pleasurable to us. Man therefore loves that which causes pleasurable sensations. The causes of these pleasurable sensations, whatever they may be, he designates as beautiful, but beauty has different and equivalent terms. To the sense of smell, beauty is known as a fragrance. To the sense of taste, beauty is known as delicious. And to the sense of hearing, it is known as harmony. That which is beautiful, therefore, is that which is harmonious to our being. Consequently, we Rosicrucians contend that love is the desire for harmony. However, love of that which would be harmony only to the physical senses would leave certain other loves unrequited. The love of the intellect for the realization of its ideals would be neglected. The love of the emotional self would be forgotten, leaving it torn with fears, perhaps. The love of the spiritual self to express its sentiments physically would also be submerged. If we were to concentrate on a love which brings harmony alone to the physical senses, only as we experience the harmony of our whole being, all aspects of ourselves, do we experience absolute love, complete satisfaction. The absolute love is found in the health of the body and in the desire to maintain itself. It also consists of the love to experience the creative powers of the mind and the love to express the spiritual values, such as a compassion and self-sacrifice. The unity of these three loves then results in the great Rosicrucian ideal, peace profound. This concludes our analysis of the three dimensions of our consciousness, of our existence, the mystical trinity of life, light, and love. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.